So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome at the UIC uh, for the presentation of our report, our 2018 report on combined transport in Europe. It has been uh, steered by the Combined Transport Group of UIC, and um, it has been produced in collaboration with the uh, BSL Transportation Consultants. Uh, this introduction was uh, supposed to be done by Sandra Genot. Uh, the director of um, the freight department at UIC, but as you can guess, I'm not Sandra. <laughs> uh, Sandra was attending a meeting in Portugal and uh, her flight was delayed. She should land uh, around 4.30 today, so um, uh, it's because of bad weather conditions. And you can see also you, the bad weather conditions uh, uh, affected uh, mostly the French audience. <laughs> it's quite strange. Uh, so, first, what, what is the, the Combined Transport Group? It's um, um, the Combined Transport Group of the U UIC uh, as the aim to develop and uh, the international cooperation uh, between all railway undertakings uh, with a view uh, to advancing and promoting intermodal uh, techniques, making them reliable, uh, competitive, better suited to uh, the requirements of the market and uh, the environment. So the Combined Transport Group is working on uh, productivity improvements, communication, uh, business fac facilitation and uh, market knowledge, which is the point today. Another field of action is uh, also to strengthen the cooperation with the other main stakeholders, of course the uh, UIRR, UIP, uh, the GNTC there today, um, uh, and the business partners such as the, the Maritime Ports, and we are very pleased to welcome the Port of Hamburg today. Um, this report is a periodic publication, and it stems directly from the DOMIS, uh, the UIC DOMIS project in 2005, which analyzed the prospects, the constraints, and the development of the conditions of combined transport in Europe by um, a period around 2015-2020. And the final report of DOMIS at that time was called uh, Agenda 2015 for Combined Transport in Europe, uh, proposed a toolbox of measures uh, and best practices um, in the different fields of combined transport. And the idea was to cope operations with a strong growth of combined transport in the perspective of expected uh, infrastructure capacity constraints. So it was decided in the aftermath of uh, the interest raised by DOMIS and after the success of the first report to deliver an update report every two years. Um, so with this uh, series of reports, the UIC wants to deliver evidence of the importance of uh, the intermodal industry in Europe, to provide market data uh, for the intermodal industry, to establish a time series on the evolution of the intermodal industry, and put um, intermodal and combined transport in, uh, at the heart of the discussion of model, sh on, uh, model shift. So the results presented today uh, are a clear indication of how active the combined transport uh, industry is. Uh, there is the steady growth demonstrated year after year shows how important it is um, for the combined transport stakeholders to have adequate conditions to ensure modal shift towards rail is further realized. So this is the seventh edition. It contains a focus on the uh, European fleet wagon, wagon fleet, sorry, including uh, current figures. Uh, as well as the expected trend by 2025. The report also includes a spotlight analysis uh, on the development of the interland market and seaport activity. And the third spotlight analysis is a detail, detailed sorry, overview with a list of the relevant national funding programs on combined transport in Europe. Um, to our knowledge, uh, this report is the only such comprehensive document available on combined transport, 
with a follow-up of trends in this particular market. So what are the next steps for combined transport? The combined transport group will continue its works. It will strengthen its cooperation with other stakeholders and disseminate this report to the community. In the last report, two years ago, the survey participants expected uh, an average growth rate for the combined transport market in 2016 and 2017 of approximately 4% per year. And you will see that the growth expectations proved fairly accurate. In view of the geographical focus of uh, future combined transport developments toward the east, the estimated prospects are also very positive. Our members expect attractive market opportunities and volume potential for combined transport, particularly on the corridor towards Eastern Europe and North and East Asia. But also the future perspectives for combined transport activities to Turkey, Russia and Central Asia are quite optimistic, as you will see in the presentation. So enjoy this presentation and the report. There will be a short uh, question and answer uh, at the end of the presentation with some of our, of our key partners and uh, customers. And see you uh, at the end um, for a farewell coffee and tea. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Matthias Lahmann with BSL Transportation. Um, we um, supplied UIC in um, with this report. I think it's easier for you to, to sit here yeah, um, to present you a brief overview of the study and the report. And I think, it, I, and I hope it gives you a good overview that you are more interesting in, in reading the full report afterwards. If there are any questions or requests, please ask. Um, so this is just the, the overview of it. As Eric um, said before, we've got an overview of the general framework. So the development of rail transportation in Europe, then going down into the combined transport and its framework, facts and figures of the report and um, business. And then um, with a special focus for this year, as Eric said, in this uh, spotlight analysis, for example, for the wagon fleet in combined transport of port activities, which are very relevant for the CT and um, the national plans to support um, the combined transport in Europe. And then a uh, short ov overview of market assessment, how it's going on within the next years for combined transport in Europe. Okay, starting, starting with a general overview, as you all know, um, the, the rail market develops, I would say, quite stable within the last um, years and also the last 10 or, or 20 years. There's no big change. Um, the, the main competitor, the road, is still more than two-thirds worth of the, the total transportation market and rail transport share is between 75 and 18.5% 18, within the last years. Um, there's no real change in it. Pardon? Yeah, 75. <laughs> yeah, hopefully in 10 years. Yeah. This is the rail chair in, in ton kilometers. And now coming to the specific submarkets and rail share, as you see here, the, the total rail market, um, it's not down under, as you see uh, below, total rail freight in ton kilometers and in tons. This is the same as you see the slide before. There's nearly no change, just uh, a minor difference between tons 
and it's on kilometers in the development, but nearly uh, a change of um, one or minus five percent from 2005 onwards. Um, 2005 is the 100 percent, and then um, the slide is showing the the change in um, and the development in combined transport. But as you see also. Um, Above is the intermodal rail rate and development in tons and in ton kilometers. And ton kilometers is an increase of more than 30%. And in tons, it is more than 50% since 2005. And this is, of course, significantly better than the total rail freight market in Europe. Okay, and um, the, the share of combined transport and intermodal rail freight is approximately 22%, as you see here, in average for Europe. This 21.6% is the average of European countries, and you see also the, the differences between the countries in Europe. and. Uh, of course, Ireland is a bit higher, but on a very low level of um, total rail freight. But Italy is quite high, the intermodal rail freight share. And you see also on the right side um, several countries with a very low share of intermodal rail freight. So it is very different from country to country where combined transport is or has a, a development and a bigger share in total rail freight here. So this is the overview to go one step deeper into the railroad combined transport, transport market activities and development. So since um, 2005, as Eric said, um, the report is counting and looking and assessing the, the market facts and figures. And the main figure is the TU development, toy development of combined transport in Europe. It is um, unaccompanied transport and accompanied transport. I hope you can see it by, by color. Um, the biggest share is the unaccompanied transport. And uh, in total, it is 22.5 million toy. Um, the basis is 2017, where we have got the full data um, based on the stakeholders and the, the questionnaires and discussions with the different stakeholders and the analysis for the um, total um, CT market in Europe. So it's an increase of more than 7% by 2015. And I think it's important. Um, it, it is another increase um, like some years before, but Please have also in mind that there are several um, challenges also in 2016 and 2017. Um, for example, the, the keyword Rastatt is only one example for it. But in total, it is still um, a change and increase, which is uh, quite good for the combined transport market in Europe. So going a step um, deeper into some details. We are looking on the two sub-markets, um, the domestic markets in Europe and the international cross-border markets for the combined transport. And the key driver is still um, market development in the international and cross-border city market with an increase of um, more than 
or approximately 12%, and of more than 80% compared to 2005. The domestic market is also um, increasing and a positive development, but um, yeah, a, a bit less or uh, lower in increase rates since 2005, but also since 2015. So it is still the, the bigger part in sub-market, but the, the increase of the total market is based um, mainly on the increase of the international market here. And then um, for additional information, we subdivided these markets into um, continental and maritime um, market, which is, um, I think, um, important also for the port activities from ports and so on, um, to have the details for, for these sub-markets. Okay, and um, when we see on combined transport, we have got a road lag and a rail lag. The road lag is um, hopefully the, the shorter way to come to the, to the rail. It is quite difficult to, to analyze it. Um, we did it and we put it into the report also, but the, the main interest for us is the rail lag and the structure, as you see here. And I would like to give you just an overview of the, the averages here. As you can imagine, in continental and in, sorry, in domestic market, um, of course, it is limited. And the average distance is approximately 400 kilometers, nearly 400 kilometers in the domestic market. So it's the way and the distance for, for the rail part of the, the transport chain. Um, in international um, combined transport, this rail lag is um, nearly double um, that part, so approximately 800 kilometers rail lag um, for combined transport. And I think this is, um, of course, the base of competitiveness of the combined transport in Europe, because um, therefore the, the road and the lorry is um, not that competitive um, for, for the full length of the transport and the distance, and that's um, the importance and the main argument for combined transport um, railroad um, for longer, of course, for longer variations um, to have the combination between um, road and rail to do so. So these are um, activities and assessment and uh, figures for the combined transport market. Of course, we have got, we saw this um, minor sub-market of accompanied freight traffic, which is also important, but as you see, it is um, approximately less than 10% um, of the total market, only um, 0.7 million toys in Europe. And the main volume for these accompanied freight traffic is, of course, um, uh, the, the tunnel of, between UK and France, uh, this is one major relation, and between Germany and Italy and Austria and Slovenia is also an important relation for the accompanied uh, transport railroad in Europe. This is, um, the volumes here are based on, on shipments, which are relevant for this um, market. Um, but this sub-market is not that increasing like the, the total market or the unaccompanied um, transport in Europe. So it is more or less still a, a niche market in, in Europe. 
but of course for these relations very important. Okay, <clears throat> this is just an overview and we've got additional information within the report. Um, now we would like to go into some specific spotlight analysis, analysis. and this year um, we are starting with a new one. It's a wagon fleet analysis, but we have got another um, analysis of this, this wagon fleet, but it is um, now 11 years old and um, everybody is interesting as how these wagon fleet um, composition and volume um, changed within these last um, 11 years. So therefore we look on the CT wagon fleet and then come to some other specific spotlights for the market. Starting with the, the wagon fleet um, now we have got more than 64,000 wagons and for us it is interesting these wagons which are really specialized for in terms of um, the CT of combined transport in Europe. Not these wagons which could be also used um, for CT but which are specialized here and as you see the number which is quite high and it is an increase um, of more than 10% regarding and compared to, to the latest figures. And um, the difference is that the focus is more and more on the bigger and, and longer wagons. This is just a, a structure and overview of um, the, the fleet composition of these 64,000 um, wagons for intermodal transport in Europe. <clears throat> and we are also um, asking the participants in this um, market analysis regarding the age structure of these wagons and the city wagon fleet. And um, for most of the, the fleet types, it is approximately 20 years, the average um, age of um, the fleet. And as you see, there are also some um, wagons which are nearly um, 40 years old. So the, the lifetime of a wagon is approximately... Um, 35 years, of course, it could be also 40, but this is also a challenge um, for the current market and for the future because um, it is quite difficult um, to meet um, the changing market um, expectations on the demand side um, with a fleet which is uh, 20 years old or 35 years old. So the, the change in the, in, on the demand side is um, more rapid um, than you can change the, the infrastructure in terms of fleet in, in this case here. So this will be also is a challenge currently, but it will be more important into the future how to to set the structure um, for changing demands and expectations here for the wagon fleet. So we also ask um, regarding the flu future, future of the wagon fleet, as you see here, for the different types of the fleet, which is um, very important not only for manufacturers but also for the whole market. Um, as you see, in an overview, it is for us it is quite um, surprising that the increase in, in volumes, as you see on the right hand here, um, until 2025, which is in, in six years, is um, quite low regarding and having in mind 
um, the increase in total CT market for the last year and hopefully also for the future. But um, it's just an expectation. But what you see is that the development will focus on larger and longer wagons. So this is a trend which is expected for the, the mid-term future, I would say, for the next seven years for the CT market in Europe. And, for example, um, the, the greatest change and expectation and increase is for the six-axle double-pocket wagons where nearly everybody of the stakeholders, given an expectation, um, expected an increase in the wagon fleet. So, um, just for an overview, we ask also and have a workshop um, in, in terms of key, key drivers and challenges, as I said before, of course, there are some challenges um, which are um, market internally like um, limited number of wagon manufacturers, but I think the most important challenge is to have um, on the one hand, and as you see on the, on the left side, the um, regulatory base and framework, which is changing, and the approval of wagons, for example. And on the other hand, um, the demand side and technical developments and innovation in terms of um, possibilities uh, of wagon technologies here. I think um, in, in these aspects, market will be very interesting for, for the next years and I think the USC will have another view on the market within the next um, years expecting or looking on expectations and a realization of these market challenges. Okay, just an overview to see um, the wagon fleet as one spotlight, another um, are the seaport activities in Europe and, of course, hinterland transportation, hopefully by rail, and we analyze it. Um, <coughs> seeing the, the volume and um, the changing vol volume of the um, container throughput in, in mil million TU. Um, there are several positive changes, like um, the bigger ports of Rotterdam and Antwerp, for example, but also um, for some smaller ports, which have really high increases in volumes, like um, Barcelona, Piraeus, or um, Genova, Italy, with more than 15% um, and in Barcelona as one example of more than 50%. So this is a very important part also for combined transport in Europe, this increase here um, in the port activities. So which is very relevant is of course um, the uh, rail hinterland volume from the port, of course, looking for the combined transport in Europe. Um, and, yeah, thank you very much for, as you can uh, discuss afterwards with, with Mr. Matern, um, it is Hamburg with a real positive example for rail hinterland activities. Uh, still positive um, here, but um, there are some other ports with a very um, positive and high increase um, in rail hinterland activities in 2015, um, looking on the changes to 2015 before, um, like Trieste and Gdansk um, in Poland, with more than 60% of um, rail hinterland I increase. Um, yeah, of course, this is one driver for um, <clears throat> for changing um, combined transport activities on, on the rail. So, this is um, 
short overview and we are looking uh, a bit more detailed into some of the ports with the key figures, key figures um, from the view of the combined transport in, in Europe. Um, so we have got some overviews uh, of some ports. Um, here is one example, uh, a smaller example of the port in, in, in Copa. Um, Slovenia, which is a positive example. I hope um, you can see and understand the overview in this um, short time frame. Um, as you see um, above, the, the container throughput, which is changing very positive with an increase within the last years of more than 50%, and also very positive increase in terms of containers carried by rail for um, this port. And so the, the model split in terms of rail share of total seaborne throughput in, in 2017 is more than 50% um, on the rail. So this is a very positive example. Um, of course, there are also some other ports in Europe um, we are looking for, for some specific and positive examples here for the presentation. And um, the other very positive example, of course, is, is Hamburg, um, which has got a high rail share and an increasing rail share, which is um, extremely positive because the total number of containers throughput is, um, yeah, is only changing uh, on, a, on a lower basis and it is decreasing within the last year but the rail volume is um, positive and still increasing for, for Hamburg for example and um, as you see here you can also see for the different ports um, the, the structure of um, the, the port within the rail freight corridors on the, the left side, but also the structure of the total throughput and the different kinds of throughput, um, where it is coming from, the volume, where it is going to, in terms of hinterland transportation, coming from deep sea, short sea, or feeder, and going into the total, uh, to the hinterland, and um, of course, we would be happy to see the, the rail share, but it is also interesting to see what other modes um, are um, relevant for these different ports in, in Europe. <clears throat> so, these are only two examples here for the ports. Um, here is a map with an overview of um, the other ports which we analyze. So, if you are interested in, um, have a look into the report and see the, the other port fact sheets for, for the ports. Pardon? Twelve ports. Twelve ports, yeah. For the other ten, so the, the ten remaining ports um, within Europe. Okay, and, yeah, Eric said it before, I think um, four years ago we um, had an overview of national plans regarding the support of combined transport in Europe and now we have got an actual and current analysis um, regarding this plans to help combined transport um, within the different countries of course and um, in addition to that there's a new program or idea um, an aggregated idea of the EU um, to support it. Um, it should um, um, put into or bring into national activities within this year, hopefully. Um, but they are still, or uh, there are already um, several combined transport activities from. The, the single countries to the support to support the combined transport as you see here 
uh, it is quite green in, in Europe. This is a positive color here because 18 countries already support um, combined transport by national programs, by different programs, um, which are enforced here. There are only a few countries who are not uh, supporting actively uh, the combined transport. And um, this is just an overview. We um, analyze it um, in a more detailed way. What are um, the, the number of measures, what kind, what target of measurement, and um, most of the measures um, support the, the operation of combined transport, but there are also, also measures for, for infrastructure and also some um, support measures for wagons, for example, or wagon fleet. But nearly all of uh, the countries support the operation of CT in Europe by different programs. And um, because it is very difficult to have an overview of these national plans, we also add a list of the single measures within the report 2018 here, but, and also a list of the, the contact persons within the, the countries um, where um, companies or other interested persons could reach for, for the details and have a contact um, to, the, to the planners and um, the, the contact partners within the companies for this CT report. Okay, this is the very brief overview of the Spotlight analysis and now coming to the market assessment and the outlook. Um, as Eric said before, yes, um, we, we start with a comparison what um, was the idea of expectations of the market participants in 2015-16, what is the trend for the next two years, they said, said it is 2.9, uh, 7.9%, sorry, um, for these years, and the actual figures are nearly um, in the range of the expectations, and in total it is very positive, the um, CT um, development, it is an increase, and as you see below, um, the, the current idea of the market trend for, it is not this year, it is the, the last year, 2018, but we get the, the figures, um, I think, in, in, in summer, it is a bit more, uh, not... Um, I think realistic for 2018 for an increase of 3.4%, but within the next two years, 2019 and 20, it is in total an increase of more than 10%. So we are very interesting to have the, the next report if um, these expectations will realize um, these another, this increase of approximately 8% in total within two years or um, already 10% in 2019 and 20 in, in combination of two years. So it is still optimistic and which is also optimistic we ask for some details expecting new markets or um, increasing markets and opportunities, especially towards um, Eastern Europe, Asia. As you see here, it is um, a very optimistic expectations regarding Eastern Europe, but also regarding Russia and Turkey and Central Asia. Um, but of course, Everybody knows it is depending on the political framework within the next years, and nobody knows. Um, but um, if there are no 
bigger changes, the expectations for combined transport in Europe is going also towards Eastern Europe and these countries and also Asia. And of course it would be interesting to see um, regarding Asia if it is um, a direct line for combined transport on um, <clears throat> in, in these um, directions. So, um, these are some items for the report, and I think everybody has got uh, one of these documents in front of you. Um, further interesting, hopefully interesting, facts and figures, ideas um, are in this 2018 report on combined transport. Um, yeah, please um, go into the details, ask for it. You can do it also now. And thank you very much um, for all the stakeholders, participants, of course, the UIC, but also um, the participants of um, the workshops, the participants of the questionnaires, of the ports, um, for the detailed analysis and for providing data for this report, because um, there's a very low level on um, data and, and facts for this combined transport market in total. So this report will give you hopefully additional um, figures and facts um, regarding this market. Thank you very much. And yeah, please ask for any details. I think we've got more. 10 minutes for, for additional questions. Thank you very much. Is there, are there any questions, any, uh, any remarks? Any... All right, I think it was fully clear. Jung? Thank you. Yes, my name is. Guillaume Montemorieu from the Faculty of North CIMED. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is about the, the share of the semi-trailer adapted to the vertical loading of the wagon, because you, you say that the vertical loading is 1% of the, of, the, of the wagon fleet. Uh, do you have a view on the, uh, the semi-trailer markets, which, is, which I can find here? Um, we are looking also on the on the um, share of, of semi trailers in in addition to these um, overall analysis. Um, I think I can show you this also because we've got some minutes for this overview. Um, hopefully, this one. Um, in terms of, pardon? yeah, of course, it is in the report. Um, but here's also the structure of the semi-trailers and for international market it's, uh, it's an important share for the total market um, based on semi-trailers. Okay, so thank, you, thank you for the answer. My question was, at the, uh, the contrary, when looking only at the semi-trailer markets, mm -hmm. uh, do you have an idea of the, uh, the, the share of the principal uh, semi-trailers? We we discussed it before. There there are some 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 figures for it here. And, and then uh, on the slide twenty eight, you talk about the expected growth. Um, is it annual or pre pre-annual? Oh, that's right. And as you said, as I said, it is um, seven point nine percent per annum, but it's not right. It's it's. Um, the, the total, it's for two years here. Yeah? So the 5% is expected is for... So the... F no, it's it's just the, the upper figure, 7.9 for for the, the time frame of the two years, but below it is for one year, the expected change, positive change for one year. So in total for two years it is um, nearly 9%, 
until 2019 and more than 10 percent um, until 2020. Yeah. So uh, I would like to come back on your question about the pocket wagon and the semi-trailers market. So what we can see uh, on the report, we can uh, also analyze on the report, is the first thing is that for the time being, the wagon, the pocket wagon are approximately 12% of the total of market, market we have on wagons assets. So for the time being, it's 12%. But what we have also seen with questionnaire and also what we have re received, is that the, this market share of the wagon for pocket wagon for the trailers is the youngest. So if you see the average age of the wagon market, you can see that average is about 20 years, but for the pocket wagon, it's only six years, something like this. So that, that's the youngest market that we have, so 7.8 for the double pocket wagon, <coughs> and average age is only it's under eight years, where the other one are 20 years. So that we can also have as analyzed that this market is the newest market because of, you can imagine, through the wagon age. That's the first thing. The second thing is also uh, about uh, the development. So for 2020, 2025, the next one, it's That's really right. also amazing to see that when we spoke about the invest, the wagon set, we have 4.8% for the top of working wagon, and the next one is about 2.6, so two, two times more invest in wagon, pocket wagon, against the other one. When you say, when you know that the invest will be about approximately 3,000 wagon per year, that's the capacity that we have today for construction of new wagons, but 3,000 new wagon per year, and in this questionnaire, the answer is to say that you have a double invest in pocket wagons against the other one. How do you explain that, that the pocket wagons will increase so drastically? Because in terms of efficiency, it's not the most, I mean, there are the trailers to carry, so it's not only that you have to put a container on it, so how do you explain this increase? So. My personal expectation, uh, explanation is that we have two different markets. You have the maritime market and you have the, co uh, the continental market. So a container is mostly maritime. What we have today is that on the maritime market, uh, approximately what could be run with the train is already on the train. So uh, the development, the, the growth that we have, it's smaller than the growth that we could have with the trailers, because this is the new market. So, huh? this market in continental, it's a new, it's, it's about 10 years, something like this, that we have already a very high uh, number of new train relations with trailers, for the trailers, for this market. Because the maritime market, it's already existing uh, already 14 years, 50 years. So I think the first, uh, uh, the first container uh, arrives in Europe in 65. So I was one year old. And so, uh, 65, we have received the, the first uh, container. So that the maritime con container, maritime market, it's already on the rail. So that the growing could become, or should come for the other one. We have also a growing expectation for, uh, for the maritime, of course, because we have uh, also a capacity uh, uh, um, problems for the time being. Huh? You know uh, everything. So that... There is also a growth in this market, maritime market, but not so high as the, the trailers market, so the continental market. But this does not answer the question why you take trailers instead of swap bodies for the continental market. And this question is difficult to answer. There is a trend. It might be a cultural aspect, because in Northern Europe you use more swap bodies in southern Europe, so in southern Europe you like the trailers much more. It's a cultural aspect, and it's an aspect, of course, also of flexibility. Uh, we asked uh, one of the biggest uh, Turkish companies if he had to invest what he would take, so uh, swap bodies or trailers. His decision was 50-50. Okay. Um, we have planned to have a, a short round table with the uh, uh, the 
main stakeholders uh, today. So uh, I, I might ask uh, Ralph Charlie Schulze and Mr. Matern to join us here in front of the audience. Uh, we have some questions to, to ask. We were expecting uh, Gilles Peter Hans from UIP, but uh, his train is not arrived in uh, Paris Gare du Nord yet. So may, uh, so may I introduce you, uh, Mr. Ralph Charlie Schutze, Managing Director of UIRR, Eric Lambert, who is the Chairman of the Combined Transport Group at UIC, and Mr. Axel Matern, who is the CEO uh, of uh, Hamburg Hafen Marketing. Dear sirs, we have some questions uh, to, to ask you, and uh, may I start with you, uh, Ralph Charlie, if you don't mind. Um, we, we all know that global warming is um, at the end of the concerns. Uh, of our fellow citizens and, uh, and forecasts indicate that uh, freight transport will continue to grow in Europe uh, by around 30% by 2030. And uh, do you think that national and European transport policies uh, are up to the stakes, particularly with regard to the development of uh, rail transport in general and of combined transports in, uh, in particular? The very clear and short answer is no. <laughs> uh, the point is, everybody talks about climate. Um, at the ITF two years ago in Leipzig, the transport minister said, we are not where we want to be. We have to have new action plans to do something against the uh, bad effects of the climate, against CO2 emissions, etc. So I think there is a willingness to do something. Then, in, um, Katowice, some uh, one month ago, there was a big meeting, and uh, there will be a train coming from Katowice next week to France, the week after to Belgium. This is part of the Rail Freight Forward project. So there are a lot of projects, initiatives, it's very fine. Um, everybody says that they want to do something, but unfortunately, it seems that they don't see there's one low-hanging fruit called combined transport, which might be the answer to their prayers. Because with the combined transport, you can have an immediate effect, a short-term effect, if you would do more combined transport. And the effect would be a positive effect for the climate immediately. Now, you're asking about the reaction of the member states. I only can tell you, having worked now four years on the combined transport directive, um, having hoped last year that uh, the proposal of the Commission, which came out the 8th of November 2017, and which was even made better through the Parliament mid of last year, we really had a modernized and ambitious new combined transport directive. What did the member states do in the Council? They went back to the medievals. Unfortunately, they took out of this directive everything related to harmonization. So there's no harmonization in this directive. And I ask myself, how are you able to roll out this network of combined transport if you have different rules in every member state? Um, we are still talking about international traffic within the common market. I would rather prefer to talk about a cross-border uh, market. But common market and cross-border business. What I see here is a nationalism coming back in Europe, and this affects directly our ambitions in combined transport. What you would need is national development plans. You could see this also in the report. National development plans, but not with different rules in every country. If you have to report to the Commission and you have different variables, different variables to report to the Commission, it doesn't make sense. And of course, looking at the density of terminals in Europe, you very well know that this is not enough. This is not enough for the capacities we need for combined transport. So actions are needed, but unfortunately, the member states are going back to the past instead of really being ambitious and reporting on the investments, trying to analyze where the investments in combined transport should be. So my solution would be clearly national development plans 
with a clear reporting on where we stand today and based on that where they want to be, invest in sustainable infrastructure and then I think we can reach our goals. But for the moment being, I'm extremely disappointed about the behavior of the member states. Thank you. Um, Mr. Matern, may I continue with you? Um, among the, the, the largest uh, European ports, Hamburg, Port of Hamburg uh, is uh, the port with the highest percentage of uh, interland transport by rail. We saw that uh, presentation. Um, while Rotterdam is around 10% uh, and we're 8%, you have 42. Uh, how do you explain this enormous difference? And um, um, what would be your recommendations to improve the model shift in the, uh, in the European ports as a whole, I would say, not, <laughs> of course, the idea is not to... <laughs> yeah, first of all, um, thank you for inviting me. Um, we are lucky in Hamburg because we inherited a very nice infrastructure and uh, the port of Hamburg is very nicely geographically in, uh, in a kind of central situation in Europe. So. Therefore, we are lucky, but we also we did a lot of other things as well. Secondly, we invested a lot of money in, in the rail infrastructure in the port. Uh, digitalization of rail infrastructure in the port is, is being done already. Now we are trying to combine all the modes together, rail, road, ships, everything. And, um, yeah, and, uh, and uh, having the infrastructure, we could uh, really good develop uh, the the transport uh, volumes into the markets and uh, in rail traffic as much as you have the more cargo you have the better services you can offer to the clients and uh, the markets are then um, using the services as well and uh, and into the main markets in from hamburg like uh, southern Germany from Munich or Nuremberg or Czech Republic, there is uh, traffic like uh, 10 or, or more trains a day from Hamburg into these uh, terminals there. So, you, yeah, you were asking as well what uh, can be done. I mean, what uh, Mr. Schulz has said already is uh, harmonization. I mean, infrastructure and harmonization, that's uh, what has to be done. Infrastructure, very difficult. I'm not so positive on that one. Um, harmonization, we just heard, is <laughs> also not the most successful thing right now in the European Union. So, but we have to work on that. I mean, otherwise, nothing will happen on, on that respect. Um, for rail traffic, you need infrastructure, you need good terminal connections in, in the markets, in, in the main markets, uh, in order to, to be able to provide sufficient and efficient uh, combined transport solutions. I'm pretty sure the companies which are doing the combined transport solutions are willing to do more. <laughs> Thank you. Eric, it's your turn. <laughs> um, the European uh, um, Sightseeing is, uh, is changing uh, with the Brexit. Uh, what are the perspectives, the obstacles, and uh, maybe the impact in terms of your volumes you, you foresee for combined transport? Yeah. Brexit is. <laughs> yes, yeah. yeah, very, very difficult. Uh, so the consumers in, in Great Britain will not uh, stop to consume the 29s of large. Uh, by midday, midnight, uh, of course, so that the consumers will need uh, their, their volumes, their, their, their goods, so that uh, the volume will not decrease between so the exchange between uh, Great Britain and Europe. The problem is uh, to know how we will manage it. That's, that's the big issue for 2019, uh, for the next months. Uh, everybody is uh, preparing themselves with uh, a hard, hard Brexit, so with border controls, and uh, so we can all, all imagine when we think about the thousand and thousand trucks, thousand thousand containers exchanging between Europe and the UK, 
if we add one, two, three days for border administrative urban, what will be the results? So we have to prepare ourselves with uh, a lot of parking place, a lot of uh, uh, showers for the uh, drivers, a lot of uh, eat and uh, restaurants for the drivers. They will have uh, to wait uh, to, to come into or to go out of the UK. So the, uh, the problem will be more uh, how we, can, we will manage the, the administrative uh, burden that we will have because of the new border that we will have. But uh, through more city. Through more city. Yeah. Almost. Yes, of course. Combined transport, Combined transport will be the answer, yeah. of course. Uh, Combined transport is, is the answer for about flexibility, reliability, and so on. Of course. So we can see already today that some uh, some ports, as Seebrugge, for example, or Rotterdam, I don't know, Hamburg also, are preparing some place for, for the waiting time and so on. Uh, and we are also preparing all of us uh, about uh, how we can manage the customs. Uh, as uh, soon as possible. So that's the question uh, about uh, customs relevant uh, urban. The answer will be uh, if we can manage this rapidly, so we will have no waiting time, too much waiting time, so that uh, the volumes will also flow as today. But we have to, to know that uh, three months, four months, six months, I don't know how, how long, we will have a big problem, of course. Thank you. Um, coming back to you, Raph Charlet, uh, and um, in the uh, outcome of uh, our report, we see that uh, the um, Europe-China railway corridors have grown considerably uh, in the recent years. Uh, do you think that this axis will um, uh, fit in time, or is rather um, a, a passing fad in the face of uh, economic pressure from the maritime world? Well, first of all, I think that uh, the whole hype of uh, Belt and Road and New Silk Road and Great Silk Road um, is part of a big strategy of China. The problem is that in Europe we have less strategy or no strategy at all. No European strategy versus Chinese strategy. So everything that China does is part of a big strategy and in Europe everybody does his own strategy at home and doesn't share it with the neighbors. What is extremely important on this development, and there is a big growth definitely in the last years, so uh, on long distances one thing is sure, truck as a unimodal mode from China to Europe is not the answer, although Euro has sent the first trucks from China to Europe and is telling us, yes, the truck is one day faster than the train with two drivers in terms of efficiency and productivity. I think this cannot be the solution. So let's concentrate on the rail business through this route. Um, what is important is to have, again, standards, to have operational rules, to have safety and security standards, to have technical capabilities like load securing, for example, and of course, the accompanying administrative procedures have to be streamlined. So at the end of the day, we have to talk to each other. So Europe has to talk to China, China has to talk to Europe, and they have defined some common rules if they want that this business uh, grows also in the future. Um, less bureaucracy, more efficiency will only come if there is a cooperation between the two. What we see for the moment between um, Budapest and uh, Belf in, uh, Belgrade, uh, this is a line where the Chinese would like to, to invest. What I heard last week is that uh, Hungary is tendering again. There will be a new tender because the Chinese simply did not accept the European standards. And of course, we have to be aware that what we have within our common market should also be a standard outside the common market. Or we adapt new standards from outside, or they adapt the European standards. But if you want to grow the business between the two continents on the rail, this is the only way. And last word, perhaps, to say that we need also hubs. We need bundling points for the volumes. In Europe, we have already Duisburg, we have Hamburg, uh, to Zhengzhou. 
in both directions, in both directions. We are in Europe. I look, the train's coming, you're right. Um, there's imbalance flows. This is part of the problem. But there's also a lack of uh, hubs in China. Because if you look at Chongqing, at Wuhan, at, at Chengdu, at all these uh, emerging cities in Western China, um, they are subs strongly subsidizing uh, these businesses through their region. But they don't work with the neighbor region, which means instead of bundling everything in Hogos or in Alashang Kudostik, what they're doing is running partly uh, half empty trains. And this has to change, and the terminal in Horgos, which has been uh, installed some years ago, is only utilized by 10%. So I think there is room for improvement, but uh, what I said before, all these harmonization is a prerequisite to successful development on this route. Thank you. And maybe to complete this answer uh, from uh, Ralph Charlie Schutz, uh, Mr. Matern, um, what is your vision of the development of uh, um, the world trade, especially on, on these routes. And uh, maybe uh, as a sub-question, um, uh, when the Suez Canal opened, uh, after it was enlarged, uh, some predicted that um, uh, some volumes may transfer from the North Range to the Mediterranean ports. Uh, is it a reality? What do you think? Uh, is it... Um, what happened? Um, I can answer the second question first. We can't see any any uh, change from from north to south. I mean, that's uh, the reason for that is maybe, or I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> that uh, the hinterland transportation, so the connection to the hinterland markets, is much better from the north than from the south. Uh, you have the the Alps to to be crossed, of course. And um, there are some ideas and some projects, uh, but the main and main volumes are being transported via the northern European ports. And um, for the the other question of uh, the Chinese, for us it's it's very interesting uh, because Hamburg is a natural hub for Europe, of course, because we are. Uh, connected to the maritime side, to the uh, uh, transshipment side, to Scandinavia, and we can receive all the trains um, from everywhere, of course, and especially the Chinese trains are already coming to Hamburg because they have the opportunity to... Uh, to, um, to what? To park? No. <laughs> To, to distribute from Hamburg into Europe, so that's that's the main thing. And um, but we have to a lot of questions to be answered on on, on that thing. And uh, for me, the main question is uh, the border crossing uh, from one system to the other. And we just had yesterday a very interesting uh, conference, just uh, discussing about all these questions. And and uh, there are not so many solutions right now. <laughs> so. Everything is uh, concentrating on Brest, Malasovice, and uh, uh, I don't see really an, an, an um, aggressive uh, um, idea from the Polish side to do something on that. And uh, the Ukraine question is still blocking everything in that respect. So it's the main question to solve is the, cro the border crossing. Um, I think the Chinese will be able to increase the eastbound volumes. They are already <laughs> uh, on the road and doing that. We have already two Chinese companies in our association as members now wanting to do that, to go into the European market. And uh, so the, but there's, the, the funny thing about the, the Belgian Road Initiative is there is no real plan even not from the Chinese side. So they want to do whatever they can do uh, in order to be everywhere <laughs> and buy infrastructure. And, and uh, so that's interesting to see who's, do, who's um, yeah, working together with the Chinese, who's uh, waking up. I mean, the Hungarians just woke up on, on that respect. And uh, we have a lot of positive signs on the Baltic states that they are not selling everything to the Chinese. And, and that's uh, important. We have to be partners. Right? We can't just let the Chinese in into Europe and doing whatever they want. So I, I'm, I'm very positive on that one. <laughs> I 
I'm glad to add something about uh, in this discussion about uh, the transfer of the volume coming from China <coughs> from the north of Paul to the south. So it's also very interesting for us as, as railway undertaking and uh, um, active in combat transport to be aware and to pay attention on this. Uh, it's perhaps an, uh, only uh, a time, uh, a matter of time, taking into account that what we have seen in the last two, three years, uh, Chinese companies has uh, invested in Belus, in Athens, so in Greece, and we have seen that the report the last two years, also the growing of the volumes from previous. The second is Trieste. Chinese has also have also invest uh, in Trieste, port of Trieste and terminal. So, and we see also increasing about 57%. And last uh, time was uh, also investment from the Chinese company in Portugal. So that they are investing in the south, in the Mediterranean seas. And taking into account that we are speaking here about growing uh, the combat transport volume, it's perhaps our job that I take into account. As you said, about interland problems, it's a us as railway undertaking active in command transport to have to, to prepare and to offer the services from this place to grow, to develop the market. The volume is so big that it's place for everybody. But as you said, for the time being, there are no interland possibility from these ports that I have named, named before. And perhaps it's up to us, and I speak about uh, for my members of the combat transport group, if we want to develop more and more the combat transport, it's up to us to offer these services. Not against homework, but it's a market. Thank you, Eric. And um, I will leave you the floor because uh, I have my last question for you. Uh, uh, we saw that combined transport is the, the most dynamic uh, uh, rail freight sector, um, especially regarding international exchanges, uh, and, and the only one. Um, so the, the outcome for, for the next two years is, is quite positive, but do you think this trend will continue? And, um, and how do you use the services of the rail freight corridors in, the, in this context? Yes, thank you. Uh Thinking about uh, development of combat transport, I have no doubt about this. So the trend is there since 10 years and it will not change. So we have, once again, what I said before, we have to offer the services. That's the, our issues. We have to be prepared. We have to, to, uh, to offer the services. About the question of the corridor, so I'm very pleased to, to have uh, Guillaume uh, on the table because it's the uh, general manager of Corridor North Sea Mediterranean. And if we have spoke before, we spoke about harmonization, we spoke about digitalization, we spoke about exchange of information and so on, taking into account that combined transport is a, a whole chain, logistic chain. So the corridor, they have also the, the place as infrastructure to also harmonize all the administrative exchange the, between all the members, uh, the, the actors of the chain. And that's they are already doing. So the corridor uh, is the answer from the infrastructure, railway infrastructure, to have the possibility to harmonize all the rules and to open the market under such of work that it will be possible to run trains all through Europe with the same rules. And that's the, the goal, I think, uh, of the corridors. That the corridors are, is, for me, the right answer from the infrastructure on the European level, for this question about harmonization, exchange of information all through the actors, with some projects as uh, ELETA, for example, uh, exchange of uh, estimated time of arrival, uh, train composition, and so on. And it's all, always also cool through, through uh, corridors. Thank you. Uh, we are at the end of our uh, short uh, meeting. Uh, are there any questions from the audience for our speakers? Anything? So thank you for, for coming um, and uh, we will and we will have uh, we, we can uh,
uh, go to the down downstairs one one uh, one level uh, downstairs on the mezzanine and we'll uh, uh, propose you a, a coffee and tea and uh, and, and soft drinks uh, enjoy and uh, we can uh, can chit chat and uh, and continue our discussions on a more more informal way thank you very much <laughs>